the whole program is the fact that people have misunderstandings of what ethics is about and to do with ethics and how ethics fits in research. And answering that kind of call, we decided to develop this program. What is ethics? And that's the question. So we are used to learn that ethics is about values. Ethics is about good and bad. If I am behaving okay, I am good, so I am being ethical. If I don't do it, I'm bad, I'm not being ethical. The distinction between what is good and what is bad is the whole basis of philosophy. And I, I recognize that is as boring as it can be because you have huge volumes discussing what is being good and what is being bad. And we know what is good. Mom said that I am a good boy. Uh, my father used to say that I was not, but mom always thought, said that I was nice. This kind of distinction we learn since we were kids. But we are talking about research. And what is good research? In 1949, a guy called Egas Moniz, a Portuguese surgeon, got a Nobel Award in medicine because he designed frontal lobotomy to treat schizophrenia. That meaning take out a chunk of the brain to treat a disease. And he got a Nobel Award. Is that good? Uh, it was. So good stuff can be defined on a period of time, on a moment of society, uh, on historical or cultural uh, thing. It's very hard to fit that into research because we cannot say anything about good research, bad research. What you are doing is good, is bad? Can you define that? So I don't think that good and bad is a good way of doing. So we are still have a question, what is ethics? Right and wrong, okay? That's the wonderful decision. If I am right, I'm ethical. If I am wrong, I'm not ethical. Uh, but this is law. If you are right, you're okay. If you are wrong, you go to jail or you, you don't get a grant, or the RAB say, no, no, no way. And when we apply this to science, uh, if you read history of science, history of medicine, history of any technology, uh, the whole history is built on people that thought it, they were right, and in reality, they were wrong. So that's what makes history funny. Because you see where people are going, and oh, oh, that's a dead end. So for us, and please note, I'm not defining anything philosophically, because I recognize that philosophy is boring, and we are not here to do it. Right and wrong is also not a, a solution. So, and we don't know what ethics is about. So let's talk about a case before telling what ethics is about. Did any one of you read about the avian H5N1 discussion that appeared in November last year and ended up in June this year? Did you have the, I, I know it's completely out of what you normally study. Well, avian H5N1 it's a very interesting virus. Uh, it only affects birds. And until now, is not transmissible to mammals. So we are safe. Then someone, a couple of uh, researchers, one in the Netherlands, one in Japan, uh, what they did simultaneously and they were in contact, one group with the other, 
uh, was to take the H5N1, the AH5N1, do a couple of mutations on the hemagglutinins, and make it transmissible, airborne transmission in ferrets. That is the best model for flu in humans. Ferrets are mammals, and the way the virus behave uh, is similar humans. Once they did that, they submit the papers for publication. The whole discussion was, can we publish it or not? The amount of discussion that this little thing caused in the literature was huge before publication. Uh, thousands of posts in the Science Forum, Science Journal, and on the Nature Forum, pro and against the publication of the technique uh, of how to transmit, how to make a virus that, is, that does not affect humans to make it affect humans. Uh, this is a very serious piece of research, and if you go to the science website, you can download how to do it. It's published. It's part of the methods and materials. If you are going to publish a research, you have to tell everybody how to do it and how to duplicate. Otherwise, it's not scientific, methodological correct. So this is how you can do it. So the whole discussion was, can they publish? What about security of everybody? Do they have the right of doing this? Do we have the right of censoring it? What kind of advances this gave to science? What is the risk to population? Uh, risk is the balance between harms and benefits. So when we talk about risk, we are talking there's a set of benefits and there's a set of harms. Which one overrides the other? What is the most important element? It was published. I have it here. So again, we have the question, what ethics is about? In the context of science, in the context of the practicum of science, not, we are not discussing philosophy. We are discussing the applicability of ethics. Ethics is about power. And the balance the strengths and the weaknesses of the groups involved in scientific endeavor, how they are represented, how they are protected, how they are present or absent in the discussion of science. This is the set of papers published in science. It was published after the whole discussion. Even if the advisory group to the President of the United States said no, at the end, scientific community managed to publish the papers. What do you think? <laughs> so, what do you think? This is a real case. This is not something that I just sat in the airplane and thought, oh, let's uh, create this kind of thing. No, this is real. This example is kind of like closing the barn door after the horses run away. I'm interested to understand or to know what kind of ethical discussion took place prior to the research even starting. Because there had to have been some kind of discussion, you know, to get approval to even do the research to begin with. This is a discussion of whether the research that was done should be published. But we need to back up in the process and understand was there any kind of ethical review prior to the research beginning? Uh, Two observations, one observation, uh, three. Let's, let's go, I'll come with four. 
first observation, this kind of research doesn't need ethics research. It doesn't involve humans. You only send to ethics review when you have human subjects. Animal research boards, uh, they care about the welfare of the animal and how it's going to be treated. And that's it. So if you are using, let's take a, um, let's take a ridiculous example, blue whales and try to infect with uh, uh, avian flu, uh, one animal board would say no way. Because first, because you are taking uh, one animal that uh, is already in, in danger. Second, it's not recognized as a good animal model for the disease that you are trying to study. So you have to prove that the animal is abundant. Second, that is a good model. Third, that you are keeping the animal on, on good conditions. It doesn't have anything to do with the reason of the research. On, any, on human boards, you have to prove the scientific validity of your protocol but not on animal board. So this is the first thing, okay? The second thing, they went to the community to ask about what do you think, but not about the ethics of what you think. So Fouché, uh, in one of the, the, the boards, he posted that it's not him, but one of his collaborators, that it's impossible for the virus to escape the lab. And I, I think this is fantastic. I, I love when scientists say it's impossible. But <laughs> it's very, but that's what he said. And nobody, because it, it's ridiculous by itself, so you don't have to, to reply. But they went and they, they asked about it. Uh, the third thing that is very important is that what is the pathological importance of A, H5, and 1 in mammals. So what would it cause if it was spread? And people, although the, the lay literature, the newspapers and everybody else, uh, deadly and whatever, uh, nobody knows. They think it would be an uh, attenuated flu. So the gain that everybody received out of this research was, can you do it? And the answer is, yes, you can. The gain is, if we have a situation like this, can we proactively create a mutant virus, virus and from the mu mutant virus end up with a vaccine before the pandemic? And the answer is yes. So there's gains. There are risks, harms. Is this ethical? Now again, we are not talking about if it's good or bad. We don't know if it's good or bad. We're not a judgment of value. We are not going to put a judgment of morality in that sense. We're not talking if it's right or wrong. They didn't break any law. They're talking about power. Oh, I can do it, and they did. Oh, I can publish, and they did. So what are the voices that are present in this research? And what are the voices that are absent of this research? that are not heard when they propose this kind of thing. So a, a very brilliant guy named Ian Graham, he's professor at uh, Ottawa, University of Ottawa. Uh, he was uh, vice president knowledge translation in CAHR for three years. Before coming to CAHR, he created a knowledge to action uh, framework to explain basically how 
do you conceptualize research and how you take research into the public? And then take those results and make them coming back as a new kind of research. It's a very simple and very easy way of interpreting what we do on a daily basis. And uh, in reality, this is one, sing one single cycle that for didactic reasons exploded into two. Uh, you should understand that as one cycle coming in, doing knowledge translation, nulling knowledge creation, and a second cycle overlapping it, doing knowledge translation. And then going back and back and back and back and back and back. Now, because of all the layers that we are going to put into this, if I left it as one single cycle at the end, as you are going to, to see in a few minutes, it would be unreadable. So only for display purposes. This is broken in two different aspects, but you have to think it as integrated. And this is why I'm, I'm saying it's going to get complicated because I'm going to put a lot of yellow stickies on top of it, so at the end, it's going to be hard. The idea here is to point what are the thinking, ethical thinking behind each and every step of the knowledge creation, meaning research, and knowledge translation, meaning application? Each and every step, there are little ethical thinking, things that we have to remember that may or may not affect these items that we put here, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just a few of the elements. So right before you even think about search, you even think about everything else, you have the influence of all the epistemology, and epistemology is a very beautiful word that means knowledge. So it's all the knowledge that was already gained that you bring into the system. And then you have all the social responsibility, your position inside, your political, uh, the political arena, uh, how granting is going to flow and everything. And that is way before you even design a protocol. Ian breaks the knowledge creation part into the beginning of the, the element that establishing partnerships and you're going all the way flowing back the circle on a large number of steps. Now, this was distributed to them, right? So, you receive it and I'm not going to bore anybody going step by step and describing it step by step, but we can just quickly show one thing or another. And when you establish partnerships, it's with whom? Are you going to give equal voice to each of your partner or some of your partners you are going to say shut up and I'm going to do whatever I think I want? So remember, you have the cycle. Everything that I'm sticking in the yellow, it's related to ethics. It's elements of thinking about ethics, okay? things that bring ethical elements into the discussion. Stakeholders mean the guys that really command the game. How they influence and how they are going to say what you have to do and where you want to do it. And, uh, and among important stakeholders, what is the theory that you are using, what is the methodology that you are using. Then we move into what are the resources that you are going to put in place. Who's the funder? Are you going to apply to NSHRC? Are you going to apply to CHR? Are you going to apply to uh, Alberta Heritage? Alberta Heritage doesn't exist anymore, right? 
<laughs> they should exist over there. I don't know about here. FRSQ. Uh, and then you have, on a different color, protection of subjects, privacy, informed consent. Why this is on a different color? One can, because I, I run out of yellow stickies, I put a purple one. This is REB. This is the only moment, the whole cycle, in the whole ethics think that REB has a voice. Everything else is not REB. When we think about our case, it's outside. They don't have to go to REB. And many, many, many cases, many, many, many research doesn't have to go to REB. So it's put on purple on purpose to show you that REB is just a quick event in the whole cycle. We go into the analysis of data that had the particularities of how data is manipulated and what techniques and what methodological choices that you have to analyze data. Uh, what are the implications? Uh, the example of AH5N1 is a good example, but. Uh, when we talk about implications to individuals and everything else, Aboriginal peoples, how we do research with Aboriginal peoples and how we do research with uh, uh, vulnerable individuals or populations, what are the implications? Authorship, where we are going to publish, what we are going to do with the, the paper. and one that people normally forget or on purpose, because once we have the data, once we did everything that we have here, we select what evidence we are going to use. So it's, have you ever read a clinical trial with negative results? A clinical trial saying, for sure, this drug doesn't cure whatever. Have you ever found one of those? I never. And justifications that you use. And remember, this is just a couple of elements that we put together that think about ethics. But we are talking about ethics here. This goes a little bit further. Part of this project that we have people working on it is to put different layers on this. One layer that we are putting is on gender and sex. Uh, because when we think about research, normally we don't think about uh, differences in gender and sex. We know that many, many, many cases, we only use male animals. We don't use female animals on our models because the female animals we reserve for reproduction. So when we get results, we already have bias on those results because we are only representing one 50% of the population on the model. So this is just one example. It's an ethical issue. We we'll just forget that. So gender is, and sex is another layer. Uh, um, business ethics is another layer and that are, is being brought. So on the knowledge translation, meaning you are taking your research that is right here, and we are going to take this research to being used by, and by whom, when, where. It starts, of course, by publication, data, and everything else. And I'm going a little bit faster. Do you allow or not allow the local power, the local voice to manifest itself in the research that you are bringing forward? Equity. 
against, uh, again, equity nothing is nothing more than the balance of power you have. Resources in this side is resources to uh, translation, not resources to creation. Conflict of interest, responsibilities, uh, resource, uh, again, uh, in, in terms of setting the criteria where knowledge is going to be applied. Uh, ethics of sustainability, so you are going to do a trial, you are going to do a research, what happens after that? So once you finish the research, what you are, what you are offering as a, um, a resource to the population that you work with. Uh, the framework is not exhausted. The, fr the intention of the framework is to give you a basis of how to think and what would be the most important elements of discussion when we think about research. Now we are going to apply the framework on a more practical way. Ideally you are going to group yourselves on affinity groups uh, by theme. So theme one, two, three or four according to CAHR, and you are going to select uh, a case of your choice. The framework is intended to give you basis for discussion. It's not something that you have to be bound to it as if it was the sole truth. It's only to help you thinking. Okay. This time, ideally outside your comfort zones. So if you are pillar four, try to discuss a pillar one. If you are a two, try to discuss a four, and so forth. Um, and let's see, let's play a little bit. There are no right and wrong answers. It's only the thinking that is important. And again, it, for us, it's extremely important, the evaluation. 